Hello. I'd like to welcome y'all to this midweek uh, Lenten worship service. We thank you all for coming. You will be in for a treat as we will have another dramatic monologue um, by Reverend Becky in just a few minutes. So now if you would please rise and as we sing hymn 286 uh, verses 1 and 2. be seated. Remember that our Lord Jesus Christ sympathizes with us in all of our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, uh, yet without sin. Let us then with I'm not moving. <laughs> huh? Um, let, sorry about that, y'all. Um, let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So if you would join me in the confession found on page 893 in your hymnal. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be truly human. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, we have built up walls of prejudice. Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, we have stifled generosity and left little time for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment, and free us from sin.
Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 15 through 19. And I ask you in respect for the gospel to please rise as we read. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See. For being here today. This is such a tender time of year for me always, and I just want everyone's hearts to be opened and their eyes to be open to see my Lord the way I see Him. It is so hard for me to believe that it's been over 2,000 years since that fateful day when my Lord was crucified on a hill in Jerusalem that the Jewish people call Golgotha, but that Roman people like myself call Calvary. The events of that day, even though they were so long ago, they stay in my mind as I remember the torture my Lord went through. Oh, but I suppose I should introduce myself to you. My name is Claudia Procula. I am the granddaughter of the Emperor Augustus and the wife of Pontius Pilate. I am the one who was invited by our Lord to give testimony to the one saying that he is the truth that he declared he is. You see, as the wife of the governor, my life was not always easy. Oh, I know you think glamorous being in the palace and all of that, but being on display in front of the people all the time? Oh, if I frowned the wrong way at the wrong time, the gossips would have a field day. And they were always writing and talking about what I was wearing and where I was. It was not all glamour that you would think. It was difficult at times, very difficult. But I tell you, the most interesting, fascinating, and difficult part of my job were the undercover assignments that I had to go through. I had to deal with undercover operations all the time in order to help my husband. 
with what he was going through. Y'all have technology problems like we did. <laughs> Not a lot changes. Yeah. Well, one of those undercover assignments that I had was one that I took upon myself. You see, my husband, Pilot, was a very shrewd politician. He was often able to negotiate compromises and work out things the way he needed for them to be in life. And I did my part in helping him. We were doing pretty well. We were headed upward in life and things were going grand for us. And that is why the Jesus problem disturbed me so much. You see, I didn't know much about this man, Jesus. I had heard tales and stories about him. But the Jewish people were having a big festival, one of their holiday festivals. They called it Passover. They were having it there in Jerusalem. And Caesar was afraid that some riots would break out. And so he had us on high alert. He was afraid because of the crowds, and he was afraid, he said, because of this man named Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I didn't know much about the man, other than those stories that were told about how he had healed people and performed miracles feeding people. But for all I knew, they were just idle tales. But I had a friend... A friend, Salome, she and her husband, Jairus, had a daughter who became very ill. And one day, Salome told me that this man, Jesus, healed their daughter. It made me wonder, could he really be the Son of God that he said he was if a friend of mine was saying that she knew that he was a healer? I really didn't know. But since this Passover was coming and part of my job is to do undercover work, I thought, I'll just dress up like a commoner and I'll go into town and I'll see what all the Jews are up to in this holiday. So I did that. I went to town, hung around with the merchants and the children and chatted it up with the women. And I'm not going to brag, mind you, but I'm a great conversationalist. And I always lace my conversations with significance. Well, I was just chatting away in a little cafe right there in the middle of Jerusalem when all of a sudden this old man comes running down the street saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. I had no idea who this old man was talking about, but everybody around me got up and they ran into the streets to greet this person who was coming into town. So I got up with him, followed along. We ran to the east side of Jerusalem towards the Mount of Olives. I really did not know who they were trying to see. And so I asked this little boy who was running along beside me, I said, who is this man? Who is this man? And he looked at me with big eyes and he said, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And just then, Jesus rode past me. He was, he was on a donkey. And people were throwing their cloaks down on the street in front of him. The people seemed to recognize that the donkey and him riding on it was a symbol, a symbol of humility, a symbol of royalty, a symbol of peace. And they were waving their palm branches toward him and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means please save us. And I thought, could this be a king that I have not met before instead of this Jesus guy? For they're treating him like royalty, like he is a king. But he, he doesn't look Roman. I've never met a king like this before. And then I got close to him, and it was that same Jesus I had heard people talking about. Could he be a king, I thought? But then he did something really strange. He got off of the donkey, 
And he started to cry. Now what kind of person rides into town like a king and then starts crying? I crept closer towards him to see what was going on. What was he crying about? And I heard him say, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had known what would bring you peace. And I thought to myself, can you bring peace? If you can bring peace, I want that peace. I need that peace in my life. But I dared not speak to him, for women in my day did not speak to men, especially not in public. But I knew I wanted to know more about this man. So I kept my eyes and my ears open that entire week as these Jewish people were celebrating. The next day, I went into town. And there Jesus was going into the temple. But this time he was not crying at all. He was mad. He was throwing over the tables of the money changers. And he was shouting at them saying, My father's house is a house of prayer for all nations. And then he went out of the temple. And he healed a blind man. And he helped a lame man start to walk. And the little children who were in the street started shouting, Blessed are you, son of David! But the Jewish leaders were upset at hearing the children say that. And they said to Jesus, Rebuke these children, make them stop. And Jesus said to them, Have you not heard that it is written, Out of the mouths of babes and children, shall come my praises. Well, that really made the Jewish leaders mad, and I couldn't understand it. Why were they upset over that? So I asked one of the Roman soldiers when I got back home why the Jewish people, the leaders, were so upset over that saying of Jesus. And they told me that Jesus was quoting one of the Jewish scriptures known as Psalm 8. Where that phrase is ascribed to the praise that should be given to God. So that by Jesus quoting that, Jesus was equating himself with God. And I thought to myself, I thought he was just a man. Could he be God? Is that what he's saying? Is this Jesus God? I had to know more. I had to know more about this man. What was it that drew me to him and drew so many others to him? Who is he? So the next day, I went back into town. And as I walked by the temple gates, I could hear the Jewish leaders asking Jesus a question. They asked him, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Oh, I needed to know what he would say to that. I needed to know his answer because if he said yes, then all of the people who'd been waving palm branches at him and following him, they would be upset and issue a riot against him. But if he said no, then it would empower and embolden all of them and they would rise up against all of the Roman officials, including my husband and myself. So I had to know, what would he say? I leaned in closely and hid so that I could hear what he was saying to them. He asked them for a coin. And he asked them whose inscription was on the coin. And someone in their group said, Caesar. And he simply, with authority, said, Then render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. As he left, I heard more of his teachings, and he talked about loving God and loving one another, caring for others, and he touched something deep in my soul, for I had always been bothered by the fact that my husband and others in our community judged the common people as less than human, and I could not understand why 
just because of accident of birth, some people were treated as less than others. I mean, if I had been born a Samaritan or a Jew, would I be less worthy of their love and their attention? Some of them would have said yes. But this Jesus said no. All people are worthy of love and acceptance. All people. What amazing, amazing love was in this man. That night I went home and I laid down to rest and think of all that I had heard from this amazing man and I was ready to get up the next day and hear more of what he had to say. But during the night, I was disturbed by a dream. A dream that made me bolt up wide awake. A dream that scared me for this man's life. A dream that prompted me to send word to my husband had nothing to do with this man, Jesus. Just as I sent that word through my servant, I heard all of this commotion and chaos going on. I went downtown and I looked and the streets were filled with an angry mob. My husband was busy chatting away with a Sanhedrin. They were asking my husband to sentence this Jesus to death. And my husband, who is normally decisive and has no problem sending someone to crucifixion, did not know what to do. He had difficulty understanding what this man's crime was. He tried sending this Jesus back to the Jewish authorities to let them deal with the Jesus problem. But they said, no, we need your order to crucify him. So my husband decided he would send Jesus to Herod. Herod was in town to try to control the crowd for the Passover. Huh. But my husband should have known. Herod is the playboy of Galilee. And I tell you, he is as worthless as he is corrupt. <laughs> so he sent him right back. My husband did not know what to do. He knew that he had the authority to release one prisoner. And so he put it up to the people to vote. Even though I had warned him not to do anything with this Jesus, he allowed the people to decide. And they said, crucify Jesus of Nazareth. And even though my husband sensed as I did that this man was innocent of all crimes, he felt he was locked in. For if he let Jesus go, then the Jews could proclaim that he had let a criminal who professed to be king free, and my husband would be in difficulty with the Roman authorities. So he told the people, I will crucify your Jesus, your king of the Jews. But I want it to be clear. I do not want to have anything to do with this. So he asked for a vase of water. And he washed his hands in front of the people. Oh, my heart sank as he issued the order for Jesus to be chained. This man whom they pressed a crown of thorns upon his head, walked past me with blood mingling down his face. I turned to my servant. I could hardly look. My heart broke so much. And it was in that moment that I decided I am following him all the way to the cross because no one should have to die alone. This man, who the crowds had praised, who had followed him, was now all alone. And no one should die alone. I know you have heard the horrors of his death. But have you ever heard the last words that he spoke from the cross before he died? I hope that you have because it was 
in those words, those final words that he spoke from the cross, that have written this image upon my brain over these years. He spoke words of forgiveness. He told those who were around him, who could hear him, that he was going to paradise and that all who believed and followed him would be in paradise with him. He spoke words of love and compassion to his beloved disciple and his mother. He expressed his faith by quoting a psalm saying that he knew that his father would take care of him and was close to him even though he felt far away. And then he said this word, Telalaste, Telalaste, which means it is finished. I did not know what he was talking about when he said that. What is finished? Surely he meant more than just his life here on earth. For he used the same word that Olympic long-distance runners use when they cross the finish line. Telalaste, Telalaste. A victory. I have finished the race. What did he have victory over? Later I heard that the curtain in the temple that separated the people from God, a symbol reminding them that sin separates us from God, was torn in two, just as Jesus breathed his last breath. Jesus had said, to his disciples just before he died, no greater love has anyone than to lay down their life for their friends. And Jesus had said that his father sent him to earth because God so loved us. Is that what was finished? That he came to do the will of his father to show us that nothing can separate us from God's love. Surely that is what is finished. His life his teachings show us God's great love for each one of us. A love that was willing to suffer and die upon the cross. A love that gives us peace. A love that gives us hope. A love that can fill us with joy. For Jesus himself had that love and is that love. And he touched my life with that love. And that's why I sing that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Open my eyes that I may see your love in each person that I meet and I may share your love with others. I want you to sing that with me as our prayer. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love, and we'll see. you will stand and sing one more time with us of the wondrous love.
And now may the peace, the love, and the grace that is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you all. Amen.